Okay, this is lesson one, um, the Bible. First off, how do we know that there is a God? Well, there's two main uh, proofs that uh, theologians and scholars and stuff use, and those are called general revelation and special revelation. Now, general revelation basically just proves that there is a God. Okay, For instance, uh, the world, when we look at what God has created, I mean, of, of course there's a God. You know, things didn't just come from nothing. Um, and our conscience, see, we know that, th that there's such a thing as right and wrong because there's a God. We, we know somewhere deep inside of us that there's a God. Um, and besides that, there are other, uh, other proofs of God. Um, things like, um, if you've ever read uh, books by Lee Strobel, he's got a book called uh, the, Ca the Case for a Creator. Um, and you know, he, in there he talks about some of those proofs. Um, writers like McDowell, Josh McDowell, for instance, have, have talked about them. There's a lot of, of, of things that, that prove that there's a God, um, but we really don't have the space to get into that today. Um, so the answer on your sheet, the first one, the world and our conscience, the first answer there is conscience. Okay. If you go to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Then in chapter 2, uh, verse 14 through 15, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, conscience, these not having the law are a law to themselves, um, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Um, so just the general idea of things being right or wrong. Um, but in, outside of general revelation, there's something called special revelation. This isn't just that we know there is a God, but who is that God? Um, so if you look at your sheet, it says, how do we know there is a God and who is he? Special revelation answers that second question, who is he? The first way um, that really helps us to know God is through Jesus Christ, uh, the, the living word of God. And if you look in John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 2, it says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Um, and then in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, this, this is the Old Testament, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, Jesus Christ, uh, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Um, so your second fill in the blank is Jesus Christ, the living word of God, the living word of God. And then uh, the third blank there on your sheet, uh, the Bible, the written word of God. Uh, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter um, 3, verse 16 says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And then in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, this is all on your sheet. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So that's the origin of the Bible right there. So the Bible, the written word of God. Those are the two um, uh, special revelations, the, the two ways that God has revealed himself called special revelation that show us exactly who is he, okay? So now, that takes us to kind of the idea, what is the Bible? So imagine this. Imagine walking through an unfamiliar forest in the middle of the night with no stars or moon out. What do you need? You need some kind of a light or something, right? That's what the Bible is. It's something that lights our way. It's something that shows us who God is. It, it, it lights up the darkness. It's how we know what's right and wrong. It, it leads us forward. Um, it's God's all-sufficient guide for faith and daily living. 
You see, it, it's, it's all we need for faith and daily living. Everything that God wants us to know is in there. Not everything there is to know, but everything that God wants us to know. Okay, um, Not that God has a problem with science, but the things that are essential for us to know are in the Word. Um, so if you look in Psalm 119, 105, so on your sheet it's God's all-sufficient guide for faith and daily living. Uh, that's the fourth fill in the blank. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and, I, and a light to my path. Exactly talking about this. So, um, it is how God most often reveals his plans and purposes. It's God's very words. Um, it's a history of how he has acted in the past and what he said in the past. And that helps us in the future because God doesn't change. So, um, waiting on God is kind of like waiting to cross the road. See, we get real impatient. We want to do things our own ways. I don't want to live your way, God. Y your laws are burdensome, so we try and live our own way. And we don't see that there's destruction coming. See, oh, well, I'm just going to walk out into the street. Or imagine I saw a picture of this one time, and I think it's very accurate. Imagine a guardrail over a cliff. And someone's, and the, the, that guardrail is God's law, God, what God, how God wants us to live our life. It's God's word. And... We look at it and we say, I don't want to live this way, and we just hop over it. Well, there's a cliff on the other side, and we jump to our death. That's kind of how it is when we choose to live our own way rather than God. And then we ask God, how can you let this happen when we're, when we're reaping the consequences of our own action? Um, so uh, on your sheet, that next one there, um, how God most often reveals his plans and purposes. Okay. It's how we know what to believe on your sheet there, how we know what to believe. It never changes. God's word never changes. Um, a certain man once thought he was supposed to marry an already married woman. How does how do we know that this is not true? Well, God's leading me. Is he though? See, it doesn't matter what you feel if it doesn't add, match up to this. Is it is it backed up by this? Now we know that that's a lie because you aren't supposed to mess with somebody else's wife. And God won't tell you that someone's going to get a divorce in advance. See what I mean? Because that that's immoral. He doesn't God doesn't act immorally. Okay? Um so the Bible came uh, from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uh, told people what to write. And they wrote it, but it still had the Bible still contains some of them, some of them in it. You know what I mean? Where when you write, when you're reading a letter, you can just kind of tell this it was written by this certain person. That's kind of how the Bible works too. You can tell that it was written by them, but it still can, it still accurately records God's word. So uh, God used men to write His message, just the same as He does today. He's not. There isn't new scripture being written. That's not what I mean to say. But God still uses people to accomplish His will in the world. You know, he could just go and make himself known to everybody, but instead he sends the church. So, um, the Bible was not written by robots. Human, the human perspective is still is still there. You know, for instance, in Joshua it says that the sun stood still. Well, we know that the sun didn't really stand still. The earth stood still because the earth goes around the sun, not the sun around the earth. But from his perspective, it looked like the sun was going. Now, does that mean that the event didn't happen? No. Does that mean that it... Um, that it somehow isn't God's word? N no, it just has that pers that human perspective to it. So the Bible contains no errors. Um, a lot of times people think that there are the, con the Bible contradicts itself. Um, there is not one single contradiction that cannot very easily be explained. See, the problem is, is people think that there's contradictions where there's not, and then they refuse to listen to an answer. So then they just say, oh, there's 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 contradictions in the Bible, but with no proof. And if there actually is no contradiction, you really can't say that there's a contradiction. Um, so here are some common reasons for misunderstanding uh, the Bible when you read it. Um, first off, if you only read certain parts, like, oh, well, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says, don't judge, so I can live however I want and don't judge me. Well, no, it's actually talking about being a critical person. Have you ever been to one of those churches where where you just walk in and everybody's judging you? They have a list a mile long about all the things you have to do. You have to dress a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way, and just not you. You know what I mean? Uh, that's what he's talking about. And the context there is 
<clears throat> has a lot to do with what the Pharisees were doing, trying to make people like them instead of helping people get to God. Um, so, you know, only reading certain parts. Well, if you read the rest of the passage, you, it's very obvious what he's saying, especially since Jesus says, judge wisely. Um, and number two, uh, misunderstanding what it is saying or what it means. Like, oh, I don't really understand what that means, so I'm just going to attribute my own meaning to it. For instance, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says about how all things work to the good for those who, um, who love God. Um, so then what people say is all things are working for my good. Basically, everything in the cosmic order is just gravitating to me. I'm the center of attention. But what Paul was really talking about was way different. So he was talking about God's ability to um, work in and through situations. But that's a conversation for another day. I could go on and on about that one. Um, in fact, I, I actually did uh, preach out of that one. So the fill in the blank there is misunderstanding on that one. Misunderstanding what it is saying or what it means. Um, and thirdly, trying to make it say what you want. There is no hell because God is love, and if God's loving, then there couldn't be a hell. Well, by your own reasoning, I can understand how you got there, but God clearly said that there was a hell. Um, Second Timothy, oops, going the wrong way. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. And then on through 17. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene among men or <laughs> Hymenius and Philetus. So, uh... Those are just three common uh, reasons for misunderstanding uh, the Bible. So we believe the Bible because of faith, not proof. The fill in the blank there is faith. However, does that mean that there is no proof for the Bible? Absolutely not. Um, my point being, you will either live constantly looking for proof of everything with God, or you will live constantly living for faith with God. For instance, God says, okay, I'm going to save your child. Well, then we go on throughout the day, and we continually look, and we don't see it happening. So we don't uh, believe. Or we say, I don't care what, what I see. This is what God said, and God is not a liar, so that's what it is. You can live either way. It's just one's God's way and one's your way. Um, now, with that being said, our faith is not blind faith. Um, archaeology, geography, and history prove what the Bible says. They're real people, real places, real events. Um, as much as possible, they're proven. Uh, most prophecies have come true. Those that haven't are set for the future, but most of the most of the prophecies have already come true. There's only a very small amount of them have anything to do with what's yet to come. The Bible was written over hundreds of years, yet its message is the same. And by a lot of different people, too. That's kind of a big, big point there. So some people have... Um, I'm... Let me make sure I didn't miss any of um, Okay, uh, I did miss one. On your sheet there, most prophecies have come true. The ones that haven't are set for the future. The future is the ga is the break there. Um, and then the next one, the Bible was written over hundreds of years, yet its message is the same. Um, okay, so has the Bible changed throughout history? I know a lot of people have made a, a really a, a career off of saying that it has, but it really hasn't. Uh, Bart Ehrman, in his book Misquoting Jesus, says that there's just all kinds of errors in the Bible. And Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code said about how the Bible is a product of man that was repeatedly changed throughout history. You know, it, it, things were, were hidden from people and, and the church lied about stuff. We have over 5,700 copies of scripture, dating as far back as the early 100s AD. And the earliest copy we have of the Old Testament is from the days of Jesus. So... And before Jesus. So, you know, let's kind of keep these things in mind. The early church fathers cited scripture so much that we could compile almost all of the New Testament just by their writings. The Old Testament that the Jews had was almost exact with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, just so you know, that is a 1,000 year gap in between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the scrolls that they already had. 1,000 year gap between those two. And still, there were very minor change uh, differences. Uh, the, it was more like you know when you're when you're writing down something and you sometimes use the wrong word or use the wrong letter. 
there's a 99% accuracy rating with the Bible. We know 99% exactly what was originally written. That means there's only a little bit of doubt in a few parts. Uh, we have found little no variation among the texts, with no major doctrine changing. Uh, for instance, in John 8, there's a story that may not have been in the original book of John. Uh, it's a story where a woman's brought forward, and they, and they say about stoning her, and Jesus said, Let you who are without sin cast the first stone. Uh, that might not have been in the first, um, in the first gospel. We don't really know. Uh, but it's just minor bits of the Bible. Once again, we're talking about 1% of the Bible. Ultimately, no message has changed. No, no areas that we're in doubt of really make a major difference. It's not like if that 1% is accounted for, Jesus is no longer God or some nonsense like that. Any errors are due to the amount of copies we have. See, yeah, there are a lot of a lot of errors in, in, the, in the manuscripts, the copies that we have. But when you have that many copies, you're going to have errors. They didn't have printing machines. They copied it all by hand. So, uh, no, the proof says that it stayed the same. There's no, there's no reasonable, reasonable uh, evidence to suggest that uh, anything has changed. So when we read the Bible, we can know that it is what, what was there. So has the Bible changed throughout history? No. The proof says it stayed the same. And we're not just talking about looking at ancient manuscripts. We're talking about archaeology and, and, and history and all kinds of stuff. So uh, what translation is right for me? Um, first off, get what you understand. If you don't understand what you're reading, it really doesn't matter how good of a translation it is. Maybe start easy and then go harder. Um, there are two different basic kinds of translations. One is called a word for word. That means what was originally written, they will try their very best in their translation to make it exactly the same. The original Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. Well, so then in a word for word, they're going to try and get English as close as possible to that. Whereas the thought for thought, they're going to try and more of summarize the idea of what's being said. An example of an NLT, I'm sorry, of a thought for thought translation is the New Living Translation, which is uh, acronymed NLT. Another example is the Message Bible. Um, a, a good, a couple good, ver good options for the word for word would be like the New American Standard, which is the NASB, or the English Standard Version, the ESV. Um, the NIV, there are multiple versions of, uh, but if you get the one that was done in 2011, um, that one's pretty good. Um, so I guess all things considered, you know, try and find one that you understand, and remember that a translation at best is still just a translation. If you have any questions about this, don't feel stupid. Honestly, it, it, it took me a long time to get this deal. Just ask questions in the bottom, in the, in the comment section, and I'll, I'll explain anything that you have questions about. See, but then there are some Bibles that aren't really translations. What they are, are they are propaganda. Um, the Jehovah's Witness, for instance, uh, have their own version of the Bible called the New World Translation, the N, uh, NWT. And it's not really even a translation. I, I know it says there, I, I, but it's a bad translation. It's not really even a translation. They add things in. They take things out. They reword things. They, they lie intentionally about what it says. They just have no idea about the original language, and they just kind of fill in the blanks however they want it to be, instead of seeing it for what it actually is. Um, as far as the the Mormon's uh, Bible, um, it's unprovable. Supposedly he had these tablets that he found or, you know, that were revealed to him or whatever, and then, of course, God took them back. So we can't really know if they are accurate or not. Um, and that's something worth mentioning. Uh, a large part of the Mormon's books are actually plagiarized from the Bible. He took parts of the Bible and just kind of tweaked it and added his own uh, spin to it. Um, so as far as, well, what about uh, Catholic Bibles? Catholic Bibles add books. Um, different people feel differently about those books. Um, some people, throughout church history, they've, seen, they've, they've been seen as important, but not necessarily God's Word. But the Catholics added it to their Bibles, and the Protestants kept it out. So it's really however you want to look at it. Um, you might enjoy reading them, but remember that throughout history they were never uh, equal with the Bible. Just remember that, however you lean on this issue. Um, the New Testament was voted by church council and church leaders separately. Um, and it's important to note that the books that they chose were already in um, 
they were already agreed that they were God's word. So extra books uh, were added after the extra books from the Catholic Bible Bibles were added after the Reformation to establish the Pope's authority. It was basically just a, a power struggle. Um, <clears throat> there are other Gospels uh, used by small groups of, po of, of cults. These are called uh, the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, there's no reason to assume that they were true. They were never in wide circulation. They claimed that there was some, some secret hidden knowledge, but they all disagreed about what that secret hidden knowledge was. And why would the church leaders have died for a half-truth? It just doesn't make sense. Um, Plus, there's no evidence that that ever existed, so that these secrets ever existed. Um, so, okay, I already mentioned that the other books never meant to scripture. The New Testament books were widely known and accepted. Those d that didn't make it weren't. That's simple. So it's not like there's there's books that you know uh, were hidden by the church. Um, the books that are in the New Testament were were well known. Um, so there were a few tests in whether a book deserved to be scripture. First off, its origin. Was it written by an apostle? For instance, Paul or Matthew? Um, so acceptance. Was it widely accepted? Was it a well-known book? Did the Christians already see it as a very important book? Agreement. Did it agree with the known scripture, with the Old Testament? Um, inspiration, did it seem inspired? Now, if you look, only the last one kind of seems subjective. The other three kind of seem very um, scholarly, up and up. Um, so just some, some real quick uh, stuff here. Uh, when people are referencing the Bible, you'll see it on your sheet, for instance. Um, they say book, chapter, verse. Genesis 1, 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Um, see, originally there was no chapter and verse separating it, so... You kind of can't be too persnickety about that. Um, the Old Testament is Genesis through Malachi. It was written before Jesus. Um, it consists of the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the boring books, uh, history, jo uh, Joshua, on down through Nehemiah, wisdom and poetry, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms, you get it, um, and prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so on. Um, the New Testament consists of the books between Matthew and Revelation. It was written after Jesus. Um, it consists of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, letters. Uh, for instance, Romans and 1 Corinthians, these were letters that, that, that Paul or whoever wrote to different churches. And the book of Revelation. Uh, there's 400 years between when the last book of the Old Testament and the, New, and the first book of the New Testament were, were written. Um, and the New Testament fulfills the old, but the old still has value. Which brings us to a, a question that a lot of times people ask, why the Old Testament? I mean, why even have it there? Wouldn't we have all just been better off if God would have just gone to the New Testament? Well, let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. It says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been given. Now, a mediator is not for the one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ may be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so we may be justified by faith. So it's our tutor, it's our guide. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all you who are baptized in Christ have uh, clothed yourselves with Christ. See, it, it, the law taught us what is right and wrong, but now that we are under Christ... We don't need that guide. We, In other words, the law didn't say everything that was wrong. It just said some things that kind of showed that there is a standard of right and wrong. Well, now we're under the law. We actually have more requirements of us now. For instance, in the law, it never said anything about thinking about someone lustfully. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but in the New Testament, it did. See, God added to the law. He said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you do it in here, you've already done it. Oh, snap. So, 
Um, okay, just a real quick there thing there. Um, so it, on your sheet there, it says what translation is right for me. We use same Old Testament books as uh, as the Jews. Um, and the other fill in the blank is New Testament decided by, where is it? I know it was just there. Oh, there it is. By origin, acceptance, agreement, and the last fill in the blank, inspiration. Okay. So that leads us to a question. How can I understand the Bible? There's a lot of different scriptures here, and I'm going to try and go through them as quickly as possible. In the book of Romans, uh, chapter 15, verse 4, it says this. For whoever was written in earlier times, whatever was written in earlier times, was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Uh, in 10, 13 through 17, it says... For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they uh, will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are, feet, are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed a report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And then in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. It says, and these are all written on your sheet so you can look them up later, except for the passage in Galatians. That is not on your sheet. If you want, you're going to have to write it down um, to look it up later. Matthew 4.4, 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of the law. So the first answer, continually study. In uh, your, your, your fill in the blank there, it's study. Proverbs chapter 3, excuse me, verses 5 through 7. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Excuse me. Acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And then the second one, meditate. What does meditate mean? It means to keep it in your mind, to think about it. Um, it's not. You don't have to do some kind of weird you know, Hindu stuff. It's just to keep it in mind and think about it throughout the day. Psalm chapter 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Um, another thing, memorize the passages. So the fill in the blank there is memorize passages. Psalm 119. Verse 11 says, Your word I have treasured in my heart for this reason, that I might not sin against you. Um... Ask others in the church. Uh, sometimes there'll be people who just kind of have a better understanding. But watch out who you ask. Sometimes there'll be people who just kind of believe some weird things. Uh, pray and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to help you understand. If it was the Holy Spirit who helped write the book in the first place, he's a great person to start to get to know about it. Uh, go to church regularly or meet with the church regularly. Um, so the fill in the bank there is church. Meet with church regularly. Um, and then lastly... Uh, Remember this, don't use scripture as a weapon. Don't don't jerk things out of context just so you can beat somebody over the head and make them feel, ba feel bad. If there's someone in sin, for instance, the Bible was never meant to uh, make them just hate themselves. I mean, there, there is a purpose behind it. So everything we believe must be built on Christ and his word. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. Please, in fact, do ask them. Post them in the comments below, and we will get to them as quickly as we can. Thank you very much for watching. The next lesson is salvation.